Okay. Uh, I think a few stragglers will come in after we start, but uh, we're five minutes into it. So my name is Quaid Morris, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, finding overrepresented gene functions. And that's the, uh, the second part of the manual, uh, mon manual module. And I'm going to be talking to you primarily about the theory of how to do this. And Daniele is going to come uh, at 2.45, sorry, at 3 o'clock. He's going to talk to you a bit more about the practice. He's going to introduce some tools uh, to do an over-enrichment analysis or over-representation analysis. These are interchangeable terms. I'll probably use over-enrichment analysis, but other people say over-representation analysis. Okay. And so, as Gary nicely pointed out this morning, there's many ways to generate gene lists, and because I come from a more uh, gene a microarray background, these are the two examples, motivating examples that I chose, but of course you have a lot of other ways of generating lists of genes or lists of proteins. And so here, one way is simply by clustering. Now people are doing this a lot less, so the idea here would be is that you sit, for example, in this case you're doing some time course uh, gene expression data, and this is uh, cell cycle gene expression data, and if you find uh, a grouping of genes based on some clustering algorithm, that gives you an obvious gene list to use. Uh, or you can do some sort of pull down or some sort of overexpression study. Maybe you do a knockdown, maybe you do a phenotypic screen. And in this case, you have a way of scoring genes, either by the ratio or by some sort of measure of enrichment um, uh, that you can use to define this gene list by simply thresholding it. The other sort of thing that we're going to talk about today is not thresholding the gene list at all and simply using this score that you come up with as a way of ranking genes. And there's a lot of types of over-enrichment analysis that you can do, use, uh, do on gene rankings instead of sets of genes. Okay. And then I have my own uh, list of ways of coming up with gene lists, but as Gary went over those before, we're going to skip right over to uh, sort of the um, summary of what an over-representation analysis looks like. Okay. And so... Before you do an overrepresentation analysis, obviously you need a gene list. And so here I just have a list of five uh, yeast genes that we're going to use as a motivating example. And you, as I said before, you have the list, you have the scores, and then you have to have a gene, set of gene annotations or attributes that you want to test for enrichment in your gene list. Right. And so the tools that Daniela is going to be describing, those attributes have already been uh, pre-collected for you. So you can just choose those by selecting them from a list. Okay, and then the, the question that you're ask, asking uh, is, are any of these gene annotations or attributes surprisingly enriched in the gene list? Right? And in order to answer that question, or the way in which you answer that question is assessing the significant, uh, sig significant enrichment, uh, statistical significance of enrichment of that annotation in your gene list according to some background distribution or your background set. And it's very important how you define that background set. We're going to say a few words about that uh, later on. And so what this means essentially is just calculating p-values. Now often when you're doing this type of over-representation analysis, you're actually testing for a whole bunch of different things at once. You have a gene list, you're trying to figure out what's going on in the list. You're going to be testing for enrichment for a whole bunch of different gene functions or a whole bunch of different gene attributes. So when calculating your p-values, you have to take that into consideration and that's called a multiple testing. And you have to do a multiple testing correction. Okay. And so... As I mentioned before, I'm talking about the theory part of this, and Daniela is going to be talking about the uh, practice part of this. And so what I'm going to go over really is, is the, sort of the standard ways that these p-values are assessed and how you do this uh, correction for multiple testing. Now, a lot of the tools that you're going to be using already do all this sort of thing for you. But you're really going to, I, I think it's important to know where these p-values come from, what exactly they mean, so that you don't misreport things. Or when other, you look at other people's papers, you can understand what it is that they did exactly. Okay, and so the first thing I'm going to talk about is, you know, sort of the bread and butter of this whole thing is called Fisher's exact test. And every, whenever you see an over-enrichment analysis and you see a p-value, that's the p-value that's almost always reported. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about two different ways of testing for multi uh, correcting for multiple testing. There are two different ways that people use. One's called a Bonferroni correction, and the other one's called a sort of FDR type correction. And I'll explain what those are in a little bit more detail. And then I'm going to briefly go over some standard statistical and tests for over-enrichment analysis. And these are tests that are going to be based, like I said before, on the gene rankings or gene scores. And Daniela is going to talk about one particular one of those tests, and this is a GSEA test. But that test is actually very uh, similar to something that I'm going to talk to you about. 
Okay, just in a review, just to go over what exactly a p-value is, I'm assuming that uh, you have the background statistics and so you've seen p-values before, but just to be precise about what we're going to be talking about for the next hour, I'm going to tell you. Okay, so the first thing you do to calculate p-value, calculate some test statistic using the data. So in this case, the enrichment analysis, the test statistic that you're calculating is the number of things in your gene list that have this annotation. Right? And then the p-value is, uh, is uh, the probability or bound on seeing that value of the test statistic, or one that's more extreme, under uh, your null hypothesis. Right? And your null hypothesis just describes what you would expect if you were sampling that, if you were generating your gene list randomly. Right? Okay, so intuitively, this isn't precisely what it is, but intuitively it, the p-value is the probability of a false positive enrichment. So what it actually is, is it's the probability of the observation of the test statistic, or one more extreme, under the null hypothesis. But everybody thinks of it as just a false positive probability. And that's you know, a fair way to think about it. And, but the reason it's defined in this kind of complicated way is that when uh, the statisticians who came up with this, they don't want to make any assumption at all about the distribution that you're actually sampling from when you could generate this gene list. Because they don't know anything about the underlying process. What they can model, though, is they can model the underlying process of what's going on if you were just randomly selecting gene lists, right? And so they're saying things about your probability of randomly generating this gene list based on your assumptions, okay? Um, I would appreciate it if you, uh, if you have any questions, just stop me right in the middle of my talk. I'm very happy to uh, stop and answer questions as we go through. Okay. So... Now I'm going to talk about Fish's exact test. And so to perform Fish's exact test, you need to do two things. Well, you have your gene list, and then you have to count the number of uh, annotations. So in this case, we have, I think, five yeast genes. And these genes, these four are annotated as, uh, in, I think it was cell cycle, I define these things as. OK, so four of the five have an annotation in cell cycle. Now to, to perform Fish's exact test, we also have to define the background population. Now, in the tools that you use, sometimes you have the background population defined for you, and sometimes you, uh, you need to define it yourself. And what I mean by defining the background population is you have to provide the gene list, uh, the, the longer the gene list that these are selected from. So, for example, if you did a microarray study, right, your background population would be all the genes that are on your microarray. So. Including the genes that you pick, right? Okay. And this is actually very important, and I'll give you an example where you can go wrong by not defining the right background population. Okay, and then the question the Fisher's exact test is asking is, what is the probability of finding four or more black genes, so we're just going to call these annotated genes black genes, in a random sample of five genes from the given background population? Right, that's our null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is we, we, we put our hands into this little bin, and we pull out five genes at random. Right? And so the p-value you get is the probability that you would observe something like this if you were just doing this randomly. Okay, and the way that you calculate it is you can just calculate sort of the, uh, the probability of seeing a certain number of black balls out of five given this background population. And then you just sum up the probabilities of four or five balls. And this gives you the p-value here. So it's the probability, uh, you know, it's the probability, okay? And that's it. That's the basis of over enrichment analysis, the calculation of this p-value. Now, you don't have to do this yourself. This is called a hypergeometric p-value because the distribution that you're plotting here is something called a hypergeometric distribution. So you might see this called a hypergeometric test, but usually people know that it's called Fisher's exact test. Okay. All right, and then this is, oh, look, this is the null distribution. Okay, and there's our p-value. So that's it. Now you've know. Now you, <laughs> that's over enrichment analysis. It's pretty straightforward. So there's a couple important details. So right now I've just talked about how to represent a uh, test for over enrichment. If, for example, you wanted to test for under enrichment, just change the color of the balls, right? And so instead of asking, do I see more cell cycle genes than I would expect? Do you, you can ask the question, do I see fewer cell cycle genes than I would expect, right? And so you count the, the number of non-cell cycle genes that you see and run Fisher's exact test on that. Okay, and then 
this is what I've uh, stressed before, that you need to do an, uh, choose an appropriate background population. So I, this is as good a time as, uh, as any to give this example. So for example, uh, early data that I, well, I worked with, people were using a, a microarray that just came, uh, contained genes from uh, that represented the immune system. Right? And so if you pull a gene list out of that microarray, even if it's a random gene list, that gene list is going to be very highly enriched for those with immune function. Right? And so if you define the background population as the entire, in this case, mouse genome, you're going to incorrectly assign very high enrichment p-values to immune function, but that's because everything that you could have possibly pulled off this array is an immune function gene. Does that make sense? Okay, and then to test for enrichment of more than one independent type of annotation, so if you want to, um, so instead of having red and black balls, you have balls that are squares or spheres, you, you just apply a Fisher's exact test separately for each type, and more on this later. Okay. So uh, Fisher's exact test is used for over enrichment of gene lists and for a single type of annotation. The p-value for Fisher's exact test, we've already gone over this, and this p-value depends both on the size of your gene list and the size of the background population, as well as the number of genes with the queried annotation in your gene list and those in the background population. Okay, so you need four numbers to do this calculation. Okay, so as I alluded to earlier, most of the time you're not doing some one test, you're doing a series of tests, like a thousand tests, and you have to correct for these thousands of tests when you calculate the p-values. Right. And then there's two types of corrections that people do. Well, first of all, I'll tell you why you need to do this correction. Uh, um, and secondly, I'll tell you about uh, controlling for the family-wise error rate. And so people call this generally a bond Ferroni correction, but I'll tell you what that is actually correcting for. And also controlling the false discovery rate. And so there's pretty much one way that people standardly use to control the uh, family-wise error rate. There are multiple ways for controlling the false discovery rate. I'm going to tell you about one that's very popular, which is called the benjamini hochberg uh, procedure. Okay, so the reason you need to control uh, the reason you need to control for multiple testing is that it's you can there's ways that in which you can win what I call the p-value lottery by simply repeating the test over and over again, right? So if you're sampling from a background population and you want to ask what the probability is of getting a random draw from that background population with four black balls and one red ball, and that probability is say like one in ten thousand. Well, you can get a sample from that background population that has four uh, black balls by simply sampling over and over again. So doing more and more draws from the same background population, right? And so, for example, I'm getting a little bit confused here because my next slide is, looks like it's my first slide. For example, if you do, if you take your p-value, say you have one in 10,000 chance of seeing something, you calculate one over the p-value, so one over ten thousand, well, one over one in ten thousand is ten thousand. So if I did ten thousand draws from this background population, I would expect on average at least one of those draws would have an observed enrichment if my p-value was one over ten thousand. Right? So if you just do draw over and over again, your expectation goes really high. You need to correct for this fact. And then that's essentially what you're doing when you're trying out different annotations. Now the annotation you might if you try out different annotations, you're changing the number of genes that are actually annotated in the background population but you're essentially running this, this computation over and over and over again. Right? So the p-values you report are no longer real p-values. They're no longer things that represent your, your, sort of your estimate of your false positives, uh, your probability of having at least one, uh, one, one false positive. And so, for example, if you're using Gene Ontology website, now I have older statistics, as Gary reported this morning, it's actually 32,000 terms now. And if you're running, in, uh, uh, if you're looking for enrichment in any one of these Gene Ontology categories, you're going to be running your test 25,000 times. Right. Okay, so you can correct for this in one of two ways. One is controlling a family-wise error rate, and that controls the probability that any single test is a false positive. So if you're going to report a lot of enrichments, and then you report a p-value, and you say that p-value controls the family-wise error rate, what you're saying is the probability that any one of the positive, uh, uh, on any one of these positive enrichments I'm reporting is uh, comes from comes due to the background distribution. So you can imagine it's a very stringent test. The other thing that you can report is you can report the false discovery rate, and this controls the proportion of positive tests. So if you report 500 positives at a false discovery rate of 10%, then you're saying that on average I expect 10% of these to uh, no more than 10% of these positives to be wrong. Okay. 
Okay, and so who's seen the bond for correction before? Okay, good. All right. This is new, uh, new material. So the way that you um, take your initial p-values and then you, <laughs> you, you, um, you change them to take into consideration the fact that you've done this multiple test is you can simply multiply the p-values that you originally calculate using Fisher's exact test by the number of tests that you've done. Right? And then this gives you a bound on this probability that any one of your tests is um, a false positive. Okay? Now, remember I said it's a bound, so it means it's greater than or equal to. So, for example, if the best p-value you get is 1 in 100 and you've done 10,000 tests, once you do the bond throwing correction, the sort of so-called corrected, corrected p-value you get is going to be 100. Right? And that, you shouldn't be scared about that. That's just because it's just a bound on the probability. So the probability is actually maybe a little bit closer to 1 in that case. Okay, and so that's, that's all you do. It's very easy to do this correction. You see this correction a lot in people's papers because it's so easy to do. You just count the number of tests that you've done. The problem is it's very stringent, right, as, as I alluded to before. So it can wash away real enrichments. And usually when you're doing these types of functional genomic analysis, you expect a lot of uh, enrichment in your gene list for a lot of the annotations you test and a lot of the attributes you test. And so in those cases, a lot of people are more willing to accept a, very, uh, a more permissive way of correcting these p-values. And in that case, you, you can correct them using what's called a false discovery rate. And as I mentioned before, what that means, that's, uh, that's a bound on the proportion of the things that you report that are wrong, right? which is different than the probability that any one of them is wrong. Right, so for example, if you report 500 positive examples, that would say on average 50 of them are wrong. Okay. So, um, the procedure that people typically use to do this is what's something that's called the step up procedure, the Benjamini Hochberg step or BRFDR. Right, and so. It's not as simple as just multiplying the p-values by something. What you have to do is you have to take all the p-values of all the tests that you've done and you rank them from highest to lowest, right? And remember, the lowest p-value is what you want, right? Because that's sort of false positive probability, right? And so uh, with each p-value, you associate a rank with the p-value. And then you, s and you also have to assign a level of significance that you want. So people tend to use 0.05 for p-values or 0.01. Right? In this case, in false discovery rate, it's, you, know, you, can some, you can use those same numbers. Sometimes people use a, a more permissive threshold to use 10%. Okay. So you take your level of significance and you start from the top of the list, which is the least significant p-value, going down to the bottom of the list, and then in each one of these, and then you calculate what I'm just going to call a q-value here. And so the q-value is your initial level of significance, 0.05 in this case, multiplied by some number. Right, so at the top of the list, that number is 1. And as you go down the list, you, that number is the number of tests you did minus the rank plus 1 divided by m. So at the bottom of the list is the bond for only correction. Right? Uh, 1 over the bond for only correction. But, so, um, so as you go down this, uh, this list, calculating these q, uh, q values, you do this test against the... Uh, you do this test at your level of significance. So you start from the top, go to the bottom, and the first time that your Q value here, sorry, let me start again with this slide. Okay, here's your p-values. What's confusing about this slide to me and presenting it is you have two ways you can do this, right? You can multiply by something or you can divide your p-values by something. And so I've done both on this slide. So let me, um, let me start again. Okay, so here are your p-values. These are your q-values. And so your q-values, in this case, are um, a changing level of significance that you're comparing against, right? So before when I was telling you about the bond froney correction, what I was doing is I was multiplying this p-value by something, by 1 over this multiple right here, and I was testing it against your level of significance, 0.05. Right? Now I've reversed those things around um, because I think it's easier to think about this way when you're doing the, uh, the step-down procedure, but I confused myself. <laughs> so, 
hopefully I haven't confused you completely yet. So let's <laughs> so let's forget everything that's come before <laughs> and start over. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Here are your p values. You take your p values and you sort them from highest to lowest, right? <laughs> the stuff at the bottom is the most significant. And you know with the p-values, you're going to be testing against the level of significance. And that level of significance is typically 0.05. And so say, and that's good, here is going to be represented by alpha. So say we do want to test against the level of significance of 0.05. Right? Okay. So now what happens is, is that the level of significance that you test against depends upon where this p-value ranks in this sorted list. Right? So at the first, uh, in the first, at the highest p-value, you test it against your original level of significance, which is 0.05. At the last p-value in the list, your most significant p-value, the smallest p-value you calculate in any of your tests, the level of significance that you test against is 0.05 times 1 over the number of tests you do. That's like 1 over 100. Right? And this is equivalent to doing a bond froney correction. Except for the bond froney correction, you'd multiply this number by 1 over uh, by 100 and then test that number versus 0.05. Okay? And that's where the confusion came. So, but when the step down procedure, what you do is you start at the top and you go down and you stop the first time that this p value is less than this q value. Right? And this q value is representing a increasing level of significance. So it gets harder and harder to pass the Q value. Right? But once you pass that, once you are able to pass that Q value by having the P value being less than that, then you stop and then your P value of 0.04 is if you threshold a 0.04 and, and say anything that's uh, any P value of 0.04 is 0.04 or, or below is a significant test, then you're controlling your false discovery rate at 5%. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> it makes sense to some people. Um, does everyone get what a false discovery rate is? No. Okay. And everyone gets that there's a step down procedure to control it called the Benjamini Hochberg. Okay. And everyone also gets that the false discovery rate that you calculate depends upon how many positive tests you say there are. Right, which makes sense because the false discovery rate is the proportion of false uh, of of positive tests that are false positive. Does that make sense? Okay, and then the last thing that is important to get is that the false discovery rate of say five percent doesn't necessarily correspond to a p value of five point oh five. It it the p value threshold that could uh, that corresponds to a given false discovery rate threshold depends on all the other p-values that you calculate when you do this enrichment analysis. Okay, so what people will say, which you'll see sometimes in papers, is we controlled at a false discovery rate of 10% and we used this p-value threshold to get that. And this procedure called the benjamin Hochberger's procedure is the one that they use to calculate what p-value you would have to use to control the false discovery rate at a certain percent. Often people use 10%, yeah. I don't know why. Um, we just see that a lot. Yeah. So it's not less than, so, so this means, okay. This, uh, once you find the threshold, yeah. everything, below that is everything below that is significant. Even the, one that, the last one. Even the last one, yeah. 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 If you get all the way down and nothing passes the threshold, you, get no, you have no significant tests. Does it happen? A lot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to say that it happens quite a lot. Right? Yeah. So number of tests is dependent on number of applications. Exactly. Okay, so 
Um, the, let me repeat the question. Why don't you repeat the question first, and then I'll repeat the question in the class. If we, now here is, uh, we're, we're assuming that we want to get a 5% of discovery rate. Okay, we want to control our false, uh, false discovery rate of 5%, yeah? No, no. So what I said, when people control a 10% false discovery rate, that's their level of significance. That corresponds to level of significance in p-value. So if you want to control the false discovery rate of 5%, you use 0.05 here, OK? Um, but what that means is if you do 10 tests, if you were to control what's called the family-wise error rate, you do the Bonferroni correction which means that instead of testing against 0.05, you test against 0.05 divided by 10, right? which is equivalent to taking your p-value, multiplying by 10, and then testing against 0.05. Now, for the false discovery rate, to figure out what the fault, uh, how to control the false discovery rate at 5%, then you have to calculate these q-values for every single one of your p-values. So you take the p-value, you rank it, and then you have a q-value that decreases and then if at any time this p-value is less than this decreasing q-value, uh, that's the threshold that you um, use for significance that will control your false discovery rate at 5%. There's no, there's no easy formula. You have to sort all your p-values. Yeah, Michelle. How would you do the family-wise then? Well, are different things, right? Your family, your family wise says, I, you know, not, there's, the family wise tells you the probability that any one of the, your positives, the tests that are significant, is a false positive. So the, the way that I typically like to see it reported in papers is we, you say we control the false discovery rate at x percent uh, using this p-value threshold that we calculated using Benjamini Hochberg step-down procedure. And in the individual p-value for each of the categories, it doesn't matter as much because there's still a 5% chance that any one of those faults, right? So what people sometimes do when they report uh, false discovery rate is they report the q-value. And the Q value of the report is slightly different than this, but what they ultimately report is they report the threshold. Uh, it's a bit confusing, but when they, what they, there's a transformation that you can do that says, okay, I've got this P value. Uh, I deem this test to be significant, so the P value is below the threshold. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to report the level of significance at which this test would still be significance. significant. So the smallest level of significance. And there's a very easy way to calculate that I can talk, tell you about after class or in the break. But I mean, that's usually what people report. Yeah. And they call that the Q value. Yeah. So are you obligated to test all possible uh, ontogenies? Because it, That's it, the, yeah. it, it would be easy to say, okay, well, I've, I've got my top 10 ontogenies that I'm really interested in, yeah. and I'm going to test those and, and hopefully come up with fewer false positives that way. But of course, if you're, you're then to be intellectually rigorous, you would then have to stop if you, if you find nothing, right? If, if, if you find nothing of significance in those 10 ontogenies. So is there any way other than sheer force of will to resist the temptation to move further down and search for additional ontogenies at which significance would be achieved? Um, so to answer your first question, I mean, one way that you can do this is, is ahead of time decide what it is you're going to test. Right. Right. And if you ahead of time say, I'm not going to test the whole goal ontology, you could do that. Right. Um, you say, I'm only going to test the ghost slim. This is something that Gary talked about this morning. And instead of being 25,000 categories, you're looking at often less than 100 categories, depending on your organism. Um, the other thing you can do is you can do kind of a power analysis. You can say, look, I'm not going to test any goal, uh, ontology category that has fewer than n number of annotations. Right. 
And so as long as you're making these decisions before you're looking at the data and then defining, you know, then you're in good shape, right? Um, you can also make these decisions based on the size of your gene list, for example. Right? Um, whether you can look at 10, decide that you're not happy with the result, and then look at 100, um, that's something you're going to have to think about a little bit. And I'll, it's going to take me about five minutes of thinking about it. So let's talk about it after the break. Sure. Yeah. One observation. Yeah. That strategy, strategy would probably be very useful if you use both Roni for ranking, because that, that's so cumulative for any, anything else in that family. But with the FDR, if you have sets, because usually these sets yeah. in enrichment analysis are highly redundant. So if you keep adding stuff that's quite redundant to what you have already found, and the proportion of two positives is about the same, I don't think there should be such a huge bar that just by expanding the number of sets you're testing. Uh, so you're saying if you expand your sets? Yeah, like if you, instead of testing 10, you test all of them. And then you have about the same, I mean, unless you're really good that you already know what should come up. Right. But say you don't really know that. Even if you test a lot of them, the FDR correction shouldn't be too, uh, punitive because you have done so many tests. Because you, 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 you have about the same fraction of two positives. Right. If you test a few, if you test a lot. That's, that's my, own, my own idea about the problem. So um, uh, what Daniele is saying is um, when, you, uh, when you look at the goal ontology, a lot of the categories, there's a lot of overlap among the categories. Right? And so if you just test a random subset or you test a much larger set of the, uh, the categories in the goal ontology, you're sort of, uh, you're, you're, those tests are all going to be basically with the same annotation over and over again. So, but by expanding the number of annotations you're testing, you're not actually going to be changing very much because then the same proportion are going to end up being significant. I don't completely agree with that, but, you know, that's your experience and, uh, you know, uh, you have a lot more experience doing that type of thing than I do. But certainly what I find is doing this kind of power calculation ahead of time is a very good thing to do. If you can say, look, I'm not going to look at any geontology category with fewer than 30 annotations, you actually cut out a lot of the uh, geontology categories. I apologize. How, how is that a, a power calculation exactly? Like, does it, does, can you, can you take that selection and actually convert that into, you know, now having excluded everything with fewer than 30 annotations, um, I now have a 95% power to detect an XYZ effect, or wow. you know, it, it seems more like a threshold rather than a, a true power calculation. That's right. I, mean, I don't mean it's a true power calculation. I mean, it's inspired by the idea that if you, if you have something that has fewer than 30 annotations, you're not going to actually be able to detect any enrichment. Yeah. Yeah. So the number of annotations that you can test totally depends on the size of your gene list, then obviously on the power system. Have 100 genes in your gene list, you're not going to test 30,000 annotations. It doesn't make much sense because randomly one of them will fit. Right, yeah. So, how do you calculate how many annotations should you be testing on a given set number of genes that you had in your list? I guess that's not my question. Well, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that calculation if you want. Okay. <laughs> so, um, any more questions? Okay, great. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, we need to correct the p-values for the fact that we're doing multiple tests. There's two types of corrections. The von Froni correction, which controls the family-wise error rate. Uh, and then there's, a, I talked about the Benjamin E. Hoshberg procedure, it controls FDR, and that's the expected proportion of hits that are due to random chance. And you can control the stringency or the number, you can improve your chance to get significant hits by carefully choosing which annotation categories to test, and that's because e both of these tests depend upon, both of these corrections depend upon the number of tests that you do. So if you have a good way of filtering tests before you look at your gene list, you should. Okay, and so the last part, last thing I'm going to talk about is statistical tests for uh, over enrichment analysis are based on gene rankings or gene scores. Okay, and so um, 
I have somewhat limited time, so I'm going to skip the section that says why do I, why can't I use the t-test. Um, it should be pretty obvious once we get to start explaining these other tests that I'm going to talk about. So, yeah. Oh, do I? Okay, so I, I've got to 245? Yes. Okay, great. Good, I'll talk about the t-test then. <laughs> I'm afraid that I'm not going to do a power calculation without any notes <laughs> on the board in front of you in five minutes. <laughs> but if you could do that, or if you could do that, <laughs> I'd be very happy to see someone do that. I don't know anyone who could do that. So, um, okay. So, why can't you use the t-test? Okay, well, let's just take a step back. So, um, what I've been talking about up to now is, is whether or not you have a gene list. Now, I talked about doing multiple test correction. You still have to do multiple test corrections if you're looking at gene rankings instead of a gene list. But, um, sometimes, um, you can assign values to every gene that you're interested in. Say, you're looking at, you know, degree of overexpression when you knock down a, a particular microRNA or whatever, right? Um, so, in that case, you might want to make use of the fact that you're actually able to measure some sort of quantitative or semi-quantitative value and associate it with each one of your genes or proteins, right? And often, that type of information can give you a lot more information than that type of analysis can give you a lot more information than just choosing an arbitrary threshold to call a gene list, okay? And so, when I'm going to call those things, I'm just going to call those scores so I can talk about them in a very abstract way. And there's two things you can do with scores. You can rank, use the scores to rank the genes from highest to lowest, or you can actually use those, look at those scores themselves and say, if, is there a different distribution among scores for genes that have the annotation that I'm interested in looking at and those that don't, right? Now everybody should know that if you're looking at, you're trying to compare the distributions of scores for two different types of genes, sort of the standard thing to use is a, is a t-test, right? But in this case, Almost all the time you can't use a t-test because it makes assumptions that aren't going to be true of these gene scores. So there's actually two, um, two standard tests that have been developed and have been around for a very long time for dealing with this case. Uh, one is called, I call it the Wilcox on Man Whitney test. Uh, there's actually four names for this test. Uh, one's the Man Whitney Wilcox on, one's the Wil Wilcox on rank sum, and the other one's the Man Whitney U statistic. So you can imagine what happened here, right? Uh, the other thing is something called a Komogorov Smirnov test, and this is a test for this is the Wilcox on Man Whitney or WMW. This is this is just a robust t-test, basically what it comes down to. The Komogorov Smirnov test tests for arbitrary differences between uh, gene score distributions, and what Danielle is going to talk about is the GSCA test, which is another rank, well, it's actually a score-based test that's actually very similar to Komogorov Smirnov test. Okay, so um, as I said before, if you have scores or values or log ratios for genes of type A that are in sort of, that don't have the annotation and genes of type B that do have the annotation, one obvious thing to do is to compare it for differences between those two distributions. And typically what people use is, is, is the T statistic, which is just a corrected uh, difference of the means between these two distributions, and you can calculate the t-statistic this way. And what you would do basically is you calculate the t-statistic and then you get some value and you test that under t-distribution by calculating the cumulative area up until that point, and that gives you a p-value, right? Now you can't use the t-statistic. Why can't you use the t-statistic? Well, the first thing is, is that this assumes that these distributions are approximately Gaussian. Uh, that's almost never true. Even for log ratios for microarrays, there's almost never true that you're going to see two Gaussian distributions. So if you do that, the t-statistic becomes, if you use it in the wrong types of distribution, becomes invalid. And then when it becomes invalid, that means the p-values that you're calculating are actually wrong. So you can be making, so you could have a false positive test that, you're, that you assign a very low p-value to simply because uh, of some property that's not correctly modeled in your um, distribute uh, in your assumptions. And so um, what we're going to do is we're going to end, you know, essentially a t statistic is, tells you it, it's a test for significance of the difference of the means between the two distributions. And 
Um, you might be asking for different uh, other differences among the two different uh, distributions. It's going to become a bit clear when I show you some pictures in the next slide. Okay, so this is the case that I was worried about initially. And this is where you have sort of a black, this is the distribution of scores assigned to the genes with the annotation, and this is the distribution of scores assigned to genes without the annotation. You can see one of them looks kind of like a bell, and the other one looks like a bell with sort of a, I don't know, a, a stick hanging off of it, right? That's not really a good thing to use a t uh, uh, to use the t-test on. Now, another thing that you could be looking for is, say, for example, you're measuring log ratio, and you expect genes with a given annotation are either uh, much more highly expressed in the, in the condition you're querying, or are much expressed at a much lower level than the normal, right? And then there, what you would expect is you'd see sort of a bimodal distribution of gene score, where gene score here is log ratio. Whereas the things that don't have the annotation have a nice distribution looks like that. Well, the t-test doesn't actually test for things like that, right? Because the mean of this bimodal distribution here is right here, and it's right over top of the mean of the distribution of the things that don't have the annotation, right? And if you want to, you have to use a different statistical test to test for this types of these types of differences. So, yeah. So let's let, let's say that for example, you're comparing. Um, the fasted state and the overfed state to the freely feeding state in mice, in eukaryotic organism. Is that an example of, of where, you, where you might be looking for that kind of bimodal distribution? That there will be some genes that are very underexpressed in fasting relative to free, free feeding, and a different set perhaps that would be very much overexpressed in, in overfeeding. And so, whereas your, your freely feeding uh, group would be your normal distribution. I'm just trying to get a handle on biological situations, or other biological situations where you would encounter that kind of pattern. Is that? But actually, what I'm talking about is comparing two conditions, right? So let's say freely feeding versus fasting, right? And then you might be asking the question: Are there sets of genes that both are uh, have higher expression in the fasting condition and are have lower expression in the fasting condition? And so it's difficult for me to imagine genes that would have both those effects, but maybe you could find something like that. Let me think of something that's a little bit uh, more. Uh, I'm trying to be very abstract about it, so I don't want to define it. So we're talking necessary. We're talking here about, say, log ratio. So change in gene expression as measured by log ratio between two different conditions that you could be uh, running microarrays on. Multiple testing corrections do matter, um, but here we're talking about just so how we, okay are so. We from what you did before, or <laughs> where are we? We're talking about a different case, okay. so we're we're talking about instead of a case of defining a gene set to look at these log ratios uh, directly and ask questions about the log ratios. Okay, do you are you? Do you have a sense of what I'm talking about and things that might be expressed more highly and underexpressed in sort of fast, fasting condition? Well, say you're looking at, you're comparing tumor versus normal, and you want to find genes that change their expression in, um, in, um, in the tumor, right? And you might imagine there's some sets of genes that are overexpressed and some sets of genes that are um, underexpressed. And in some cases, you know, the annotation that you might be looking for is associated with cancer. Right, so say you're looking at cancer type A, let's say we're looking at prostate cancer, we have a set of genes that have already been identified as associated with cancer and breast cancer, I want to find out if those genes, uh, if the, my prostate cancer analysis is recovering genes that have already been associated with breast cancer. And so in that case, you might see, expect to see a bimodal distribution between those, those previously associated with breast and those not. But in this case, to generate the, the log ratio, don't you still need to do the comparison to the reference tissue? Like, isn't, isn't your log ratio, doesn't that one number already collapse two states into one? Because you're, you've already got, you know, eightfold overexpressed in tumor compared to reference tissue. Right. So I, I still don't see how that splits into two distributions. Well, there's eightfold overexpressed and eightfold underexpressed. So if this is, log, this is zero of the log ratio, Right, and say you're doing log to the base two ratio. This is three, and this is minus three. Well, won't your normal tissue just have 
a, a, an arbitrary expression right in the middle of zero because you're setting it as a reference, or are you? No, no. This is a distribution of log ratios associated with uh, genes with the annotation that you're testing and those without the annotation you're testing. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. Let's get back to your question. All right. So, say you don't want to define a gene set. If I were, if I looked at this data and I was defining a gene set, I define this to be gene set number one, I define this to be gene set number two, and then I might actually have a gene set that contained both these modes. All right, but say in this case you didn't want to define a gene set, you want to use all the data that you uh, extracted from your, your microarray. You, um, you wouldn't use thresholds, but you would still have to have some tests that would tell you whether or not you're seeing differences between the score distribution, log ratio distributions of genes with that annotation, so had been previously associated with breast cancer, and genes without that annotation that had not been previously associated with breast cancer. So the Fisher's exact test is a, uh, is a test you can use for gene lists. Yeah. And this is a test you can use for gene scores. Yeah. OK. Questions answered? OK. All right. And um, say you're doing some proteomics and you're looking at spectral counts or peptide counts, for example. Um, in that case, both your, your gene score is just uh, you know, peptide counts uh, or, or spectra that map to that peptide, and those scores are positive. Right? And, so, and often those scores, the distributions are start at zero and kind of go down, or they're very close to zero with a long tail, so they look like Poisson type things. In those cases, those things will never really look Gaussian. Right, unless you have a whole lot of uh, peptide counts. So in those cases, you can't, also can't use the p-test. Uh, sorry, <laughs> the t-test. OK. Right, so the two tests are Wilcox and Man Whitney, the Komagoro Smirnov, and GSEA, which is a Komagoro Smirnov test, basically. OK, so let's talk about the Wilcox and Man Whitney test. Okay, so Wilcox and Man Whitney test that is simply so I've uh, explained here how to calculate it. Don't really necessarily want you to know all of this, but it's all on your slides if you're mathematically oriented. But the basic idea is, is that the Wilcox and Man Whitney test more or less is just a t-test on the ranks of the scores, right? And so what you do is you take all the genes in your assay. You sort them in according to scores, from sort of the largest score to the smallest score. And then you compare the ranks of the genes that have your annotation, which are the black genes, versus the ranks of the genes that don't have your annotation. And you run a t-test on those two rankings. Right? And that's valid as long as both of these sets are relatively large. Right? And so in actuality, what you're doing to do this is you calculate what's called a rank sum. So here are all the black genes. You rank them. So uh, the first black, the highest black gene has a uh, rank of one. The second highest black gene has a rank of three. This is a rank of four and so forth. You add up all the ranks of the black genes, in this case, the ones with the annotation. That gives you uh, a rank sum of 21. And then you calculate a z-score associated with that, which is just, it's, it's difference from what you would expect the rank sum to be under random conditions. And then you evaluate that under a t distribution, or in this case, a normal distribution, because your degrees of freedom are wide, wide enough. So it's basically a t test on ranks. Um, and so what I described so far, it's only valid when there's no tied scores. But you know, nonetheless, if you're calculating Wilcox on Man Whitney, you're going to use software. And all the software does is sort of tied rank correction. Yeah. Exactly. I'm just telling you how to do it for one annotation. So you do the same thing that you do, would, would do for Fisher's exact test. You would calculate the Wilcox on Man Whitney p-value for every single one of your annotations, and then you do the multiple test correction as before. The only thing that you're changing here is you're going from Fisher's exact test to the Wilcox on Man Whitney. Um, so basically, you're 
Yeah. It's a genius versus a genius school. Yeah. Significant, yeah. So what's better? What methods better to make yourself a ranked list person and do it this way, or? If you have gene scores, I would use a rank-based metric. Right. That's. I mean, that's what I would always use if you are able to get gene scores. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you don't have that. So say you do a pull down. Yeah. Just add the details. Uh, there's a paper that came out and showed that if you threshold your rank list and use different thresholds, your result in, in enrichment analysis might, might change and sometimes in the size. So the problem is if you turn your rank list into, into a simple list, you might do it in many different ways depending on where you set your threshold. You might get different results. That's, a, that's one of the main reasons why it's preferred just to the rank list with a text that uses all the scores and all the ranks. So, so, so this is a, a problem of stability of results. Right, OK. So what uh, Daniel is saying is is that if you set a threshold, if you have gene scores and you set a threshold to define a gene set or a gene list that you're going to start with, um, that what you the enrichment that you see depends very much upon how you set that threshold. So that's another good reason. In addition to often you'll guarantee it's um, more likely you'll see enrichment if you use a rank based metric. It's also your your results are more reproducible if you do that because you're not making this arbitrary choice of threshold. Okay. Uh, no, because you're you're talking about annotations, right? Not not genes. So you've 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 got your list of genes. Every gene that you have is associated with some like say log ratio, which is positive or negative, right? And then you say this this annotation is enriched among, you know, either. Uh, so if you're doing WMW, you've got to define directionality. So you can say, this annotation is enriched am among highly expressed genes or overexpressed genes at this p-value. And if you're doing it the other direction, if you're saying, this annotation is enriched in genes that decrease their expression, then you associate a p-value with that okay, claim. So you're not measuring how, over, how overexpressed they are. You're saying any kind of overexpressed, this, this, this annotation is enriched for any kind of overexpressed. You're not drawing one of If it's if it's expressed, you know, uh, one hundred and five percent of you know, one one annotation is another, is that overexpressed? You say that's part of significant thing, you know. So so one thing you could do. So what this corresponds to. Is it is a test for significance of median differences of medians between your two distributions. So if you want to if you want to actually report a difference in degree of overexpression, you can calculate you can report the difference between your two medians, for example. Right, and then some people actually show this. There's actually a way to calculate confidence interval in your medians, which I'm not going to talk about, but I can talk about afterwards. Um, and then if you really want to do that, you can report those confidence intervals. Right, so you would use it as often in the same way that you'd use a, a t-test, right? So t-test, you say there's a sig the significance and difference in the means, you know, and you report a p-value for that, and then you can also report confidence intervals on what that mean is. So for this, you would be reporting significance and difference of medians, which makes it kind of a robust t-test. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, uh, Lee? Exactly. Or yeah. Just one. Yeah. And we're looking at the how often it's observed in a lot of genes in a gene set versus the subset. Of the exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay.
So now there's the Komogorov Smirnov test, right? So in the previous test, you could just throw away what the gene score was because it only depended upon the rank. You can no longer do this in the Komogorov Smirnov test. Um, and so what you're doing in the Komogorov Smirnov test is you're calculating cumulative distributions and then you're comparing the difference between those two, two distributions. So you're, you're asking, um, is there a point at which that I see, is there a point in this sort of gene score uh, axis where I see a lot more of the enriched genes versus, uh, in the genes with a given annotation versus those without that annotation, right? And you can calculate that by measuring the difference in the two cumulative distributions at yeah, points. Right. And so the formal question that you're asking is, is the length the largest difference between these empirical distribution functions, uh, empirical condi uh, cumulative distribution functions statistically significant or not? Okay, so there's the slide. Now let's explain what this is about. Do people know what a cumulative distribution function is? Okay, all right, good. Now I'm going to go to the board. Can I erase this? Okay. So say this is the histogram right here. Right? Everyone knows the histogram is. And I can call it I just call it probability density so I can draw smooth lines instead of boxy ones. Okay. And so the way that you calculate a cumulative distribution function is for each point, as you go along increasing gene score, you say, Is that better or worse? I'm going to sum better. all the mass up until that point. Right? Okay. So, what do I mean by that? So, imagine these were a, a bunch of boxes. So, there's one box, two box, sorry, there's one bar, two bars, three bars, four bars, and five bars. Go to the first bar, that take that, you know, let's say that covers 0.2 of the distribution. Okay. So I actually took the slide out that explained this because I assumed everybody knew what a cumulative distribution function was. <laughs> so, so here we go. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to show you one histogram right now. And then I'm going to show you how to turn that histogram into a cumulative distribution function, okay? All right. So say this is your histogram. Right? And then on the y-axis here, so these are just different bins of uh, gene score. So let's say these are log ratios. Right? Can everybody see? Yeah? Okay. All right, and then this is frequency, okay? All right, so the highest frequency is going to be, right, 100%. And it's going to be way up there. And since these bars all have to add up to 100%, Otherwise, this wouldn't be frequency. They're going to be below 100%. So let's just say this is 20%, and then this is 40%. Right? And we can do the addition ourselves. Be happy about 20% plus 20% plus 20% is 60%, plus 40% is 100%. Right? So what a cumulative distribution function is, and I'm going to put it on the same axis so it's high enough that everyone can see it, it's the sum of the frequency up until that, up until and including that point. So the first point in the cumulative distribution function is there because the sum of the frequency up until minus one is 20%. The second point in the cumulative distribution function is here because it's 20% plus 40%, so this is going to be 60%. Right? And I didn't draw this axis um, uh, high enough, right? So I'm going to run out of room, so you can imagine that I'm just going to be shrinking it as I go up. Right, so the first point in my cumulative distribution uh, function is 20%, the second one is 
I'm going to add 20% more because I get here. So now we're at 80%. And then here at the end, I'm, I'm going to be at 100%, right? Now it's a cumulative distribution function. Okay. And so here are the histograms, but they're smooth instead of boxy, but that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That just means we have a lot of really, really small boxes. And then these are the corresponding cumulative distribution functions, right? And so this is for the red one. So you can see as you go up in gene score, there's not going to be anything here. So it's going to be 0, 0, 0, 0. And then when you get to this lump here, your cumulative distribution function is going to go up really quickly because you'd be adding, adding more and more. But the, the amount that you're adding is going to be increasing until you get to this point. And then the amount that you're adding is going to slow down. Once you're beyond the lump, you basically got to 100% because there's nothing left over here. So that's what this shape looks like, right? Now this shape here where you have two <laughs> to find a modal distribution, you get to lump number one, you go up really quickly, and then you know here about half of the probability mass is in this lump, the other half is in this lump. So if you add this up, it's 50% of the frequency, and this is the other 50% of the frequency. So when you get to the gene score that's right about here, which is here, you're at about 50%. And then when you get all the way to the other side, you finally reach 100%. Okay. All right, so now all that the komogorov smirov test does is it asks, what's the largest difference between these two cumulative distribution functions? Right? And then that's just some test statistic that it assigns a probability to. So two things that are very different from each other are going to have very different cumulative distribution functions. Right? So the largest difference between those two things, those are things, this is something you can calculate with a null distribution, you can assign a p-value to, but what it's ac actually measuring is it's measuring whether or not these are different distributions, not whether or not one distribution lies to the right or the left of the other. Okay. So is there any questions about that? No? Okay. So, uh, neither of these tests is as sensitive, or, uh, and the other way of saying it is powerful as the t-test, because act, what that means is they actually require more data points to uh, detect the same amount of difference. And the reason that that's the case is, is the t-test is making these assumptions that are very, very, um, uh, sorry, um, that because the t-test can make more assumptions about the types of distributions that they're measuring than these two things can. And if you make fewer assumptions, your tests are less powerful. So if you can run a t-test on your distribution, you should, because you're going to get, you're more, it's more likely that your p-value is going to be smaller. But in most cases, you can't run a t-test, so you have to use one of these two. Okay. Now, they give you different answers, right? So as I said, this is actually mostly like a robust t-test. It tells you about the significance of difference in medians. So it tells you if one of the distributions is translated, if it's larger than the other. So if, in general, genes with a given annotation are, have a higher expression level or a lower expression level. Whereas the KS test is just going to tell you whether or not the distribution of gene scores for these two sets of genes is different. Right? And that's a very different thing, right? Okay. And this is a very rare problem that I wouldn't worry about, but I'm kind of complete about things. Is that if you have a lot of gene scores that are the same and you have a small number of observations, some people don't implement this test correctly. So um, if you're in that condition, so just a comment. Um, <laughs> if you use a, a statistical package like R or something, um, you can be convinced that they're going to implement the test correctly. If you use your friend down the street, he has some like web interface that he's just made and he says there's a WMW test, there's a small chance that they didn't implement it correctly because it's actually hard to do the implementation in these cases. Okay, so now we can go back and, and look. Yeah. Uh, if you're not convinced that it's Gaussian, don't, don't use the t-test. I shouldn't have said sometimes use the t-test. I would never use the t-test. Because why be wrong, right? So 
But if other people have previously used the t-test on the same data, use the t-test. Yeah. OK. So there, there are ways of telling if things are calcine or not, which I can tell you about after class. OK. All right. And so let's go back to the three distributions that we started looking at. One is the one where you just have a long tail. So this is obviously non-Gaussian. So here you could use any of these three tests. Um, in this case, I would only recommend either the komogorov smirov test or the GSEA test, because there's no you know, it's not like one distribution is translated with respect to the other. They both have about the same mean, but they're certainly very different. And in this case, you could again use any one of these three tests. Okay. All right. Um, so what have we learned? Well, we learned that the t-test is not valid, and most of the time, almost all the time with functional genomics data, you shouldn't use it, uh, especially when, or, when one or both of the score distributions is not normal. I'm sorry, you know what? I'm going to answer your question. Um, cases in which you can use the t-tests are ones in which you have a fairly balanced annotation and you have some well-behaving functional genomics data, like microarray log ratios. All right. So in those cases, you'll tend to see more Gaussianity because you have a, like a, you know, if you're, you're querying 20,000 genes, you have 10,000 of type A and 10,000 of type B. There might be problems with outliers, but the, a, lot of, a lot of the times those problems are going to disappear and it's, you know, most of the distribution is going to look Gaussian. Right. The reason I said don't use a t-test is a lot of the time when you're looking at gene attributes, these attributes are only true for a very small proportion of the genes. And in that case, you know, the proportion of the genes that have that annotation, they're rarely going to look Gaussian. Right? And you need both your distributions to look Gaussian to make a t-test work nicely. What's your look at annotations that have a thousand genes? You know, it's not worth it. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you could probably get away with in that case. Again, I would look at the distributions first before you did anything. And again, if you only have positive data, you're, you're back in this problem where it's probably not going to be very Gaussian. So, yeah. Okay, so this robust t-test, uh, or a test for difference medians, the WMW test, and to test for overall difference between two distributions, use the KS test or GSEA test. Okay, now, just to be complete, there's a couple other things that you might see. You might see the chi-squared test, and these are tests that are done on contingency tables. So when you're doing Fisher's exact test, you're doing it on what's called a 2x2 two two contingency table. The 2x2, two two and so Fisher's test is exact for the 2x2 two two, um, contingency table. The chi-squared test is a, is a, makes an approximation, so I would only use it for larger contingency tables because there's not really... Uh, an easy to calculate um, version of Fisher's exact test for the larger ones. And sometimes you also see people do a binomial test in cases where you would normally use a Fisher's exact test. Again, this is a type of, this is a way of approximating it. All right, so if you see either of those two things, essentially what they're doing is a Fisher's exact test. Okay. Uh, yeah, but we're talking about, so for example, um, hmm, okay. Can anyone think of an example where an attribute would have more than two values? So, for example, you could say the number of target sites for a given microRNA on the gene. You could say 0, 1, or more than 1. That's an attribute that has more than one value. And you might want to distinguish between those three, two, three different categories. Another case might be if you have protein pounds, you need three separate compartments, and right. you're looking for proteins that have the very least homogeneous distribution of local compartments. Okay, so localization to different cellular compartments, right? Like nucleus cytosol, and some sort of membrane, right? Can you use a different color? Uh, yep. Or let's say ER. 
So there's the cases where you might have attributes that are not binary value, but um, might multi value. Uh, you mean in the uh, everything we're showing you today is going to be binary? And usually, yes, you're right. People do have a binary situation. Um, any more questions? All right, so uh, now we have a short coffee break, uh, and then Danielle is going to take over uh, at 3 o'clock. So.